All right, well, hello. It is August the 27th, 2016. For the purposes of our little recording, we're here at iPad Palooza in Norman, Oklahoma, at the University of Oklahoma, in what must be one of the coolest classrooms I've ever been in. So I love green screen, and anyway, we're surrounded by screens. So today we're going to talk about the iPad Media Activity and Project Matrix. And if any of you would like to access these resources now or later. There's several ways to do that. I have given you hopefully a sticker that has a QR code and, it, and the link on there is actually to iPad Media Camp. Some of this, as I'll mention briefly, comes out of four years of doing summer iPad media camps with teachers. And so when you go to iPadMediaCamp.com, you can click the link that says Matrix, or you can go straight to the shortened link, wfriar.me slash iPadMatrix. And uh, these are, are licensed under Creative Commons attribution only, which means if you want to use them and morph them and do whatever you want, please do. Uh, you can just give attribution to me. Um, I uh, really... I'm passionate about this learning revolution we're in, and I'm passionate about sharing, and I believe that we get inspired through the generous sharing of other teachers. And so there are times and places to sell things, and I'm not telling anybody to stay off Teachers Pay Teachers. My wife's bought stuff off that, you know, and I sell some books, you know, you can buy some of my books. I'm, I'm not just giving all those away. Some of them are free. But I think the more we can share openly when we are sharing at a conference, when we're creating a lesson, there's so many beneficial ripple effects to that. So as a way of brief introduction, the last four years I've worked on a project called showwithmedia.com. What do you want to create today? This is a question I'd love students to come to my class asking, Dr. Fryer, what are we going to create today? What are we going to make today? Because that will challenge me to think, gosh, I better be giving you something to make or create, not just presenting information, as I'm about to do for the next 55 minutes. Um, because I think that's where the real that's where the real fruit is in technology use, okay? We're kind of gardeners as teachers. That's a good metaphor. Can you make tomatoes or cantaloupes grow in your backyard? Can you make them grow? Can you make a kid learn? Can it make you learn? Can it make you sit there and learn? No, you can cultivate the environment. You can try and provide a place where we feel safe and we can take risks and we can try new things. But ultimately, who's got to decide they want to grow? It's the student, right? So I, I think that, that fruit in the, in the sort of metaphor of the garden in the classroom is having students create media, creating media projects. My first book, Playing With Media, is, is for, quite a bit outdated now from 2011, and I'm going to hopefully be updating it this next year. That project said, let's, let's find places to play with tools because I've got to get comfortable playing with these before I get in front of my kids. And that's going to, you know, I just am not going to step out in front of a classroom of students if I'm not feeling comfortable using a tool. So that's playing with media. From that, though, came the realization that, gosh, teachers don't just need, hey, come play with images, and here are some image sites and things to do. What's a specific project that I can do. Let me see that project. And so that is the show with media site. There's 12 different kinds of projects that you can do. You click on one of those, you see a definition of what it is, tools that you can use, whether it's iPad or Chromebook or just go to the computer lab, mobile devices in many cases, just cell phone, uh, smartphones. And then my favorite, the examples. All right. Um, and so that's a little bit of the background. Next part of the background is iPad Media Camp. So the last four summers, I have been leading usually three-day, sometimes two-day workshops for iPad media projects uh, here in Oklahoma and sometimes around the country. And I just love this. It is my favorite professional development. Why? Number one, in the summer, we're not all thinking about we need to be in our room, you know, getting it ready, which is what happens for professional development at the start of the year and a lot of other times during the year. Number two, the focus is all on making the products, being a student. You know, I'll date myself. I graduated high school in 88, college in 92. Uh, my first computer in seventh grade was about 81 or 82. It was a Commodore 64. We had the cassette tapes that we programmed in basic and saved on a cassette. You know, and yes, the Oregon Trail that was mentioned yesterday was, remember that, you know, Zumbinis and, you know, growing up with this internet and, and being a teacher. I love being able to create. Unfortunately, today, in the 60 minutes we have, 
we're not going to be able to create, but we're going to be able to see a lot of examples of projects that kids have created. And then you can go create with your teachers and your students. And so I think this is a, a, a part of the whole process. So this is the matrix. I know you can't read that. I'm going to show you slides that are bigger. I built this this summer in Google Drawing. Who's made a Google Drawing document? There's Google Docs, there's Google Sheets, there's Google Slides, there's Google Maps, and there's Google Draw. <laughs> Google Draw basically is a fast way to make a web page. So I drew these boxes, wrote this text, and I made them links. So, and, they, and it kind of grew. So there's about 24 different projects, and you can click on each one, and we're gonna, we're gonna step through these. But let me give you a metaphor first. And here I'm gonna actually use images and little text. Um, how many of you have helped your, ch your child or grandchild swim? Or you, maybe you've taken them to the lessons. You weren't in the pool, but you've had some connection to swimming lessons, okay? I really think that learning to create and share media is like learning to swim. Hopefully, we're not starting in the deep end, okay, <laughs> on the high dive or the 10-meter board, okay? I went to the Air Force Academy. We had to take water survival. We had to jump off the 10-meter board in our full battle dress uniform BDUs, okay? They took their boots off, but, you know, that wasn't day one of water survival. There was a lot of, of work that came before we were doing something that was fairly complex, and, and in that case, even dangerous. Um, there's a metaphor here, too, to the danger online, right? There are dangers online. But one of the most important reasons we need to be creating and sharing media with our kids is the same reason we'll get in the pool or we'll have another adult that will pay <laughs> to get in the pool with our kids. And that's because they're going to learn how to make good choices, how to make good decisions. And my friend Kevin Honeycutt talks about kids being on the digital playgrounds of Snapchat or Instagram or, or Facebook, maybe not as much, but whatever the new tool is, and no adults being on the playground. Mm -hmm. How do we help our students learn to navigate? How do we learn to navigate the world? Why is there so much darkness on the internet? It's because there's more people on the internet and the internet's starting to look more like the world. And there's darkness in the world, but there's light in the world. And a big thing that, <laughs> that I believe we're here to do as teachers is to help kids learn to make good choices and learn to use media for good and not for evil. Okay, so we're talking today about projects, but we're also talking about bigger things, which are how do we help our students make good choices? How do we help them understand the choices they make and have long-term repercussions for them, their digital footprint or even their digital tattoo? But also, on a very positive sense, how do we tell the world what, what our kids are learning? How do we show them? Because the media, okay, here we are in the College of Journalism, and I hope I'm not struck down. <laughs> but I think that journalists are, are going to continue, at least in our lifetimes, to always cover if it leads, it bleeds. If there's something bad at school, there was a fight, there was a sexting incident, oh, shoot, they're, they're talking about that. Who's going to tell the story of the good things that are happening every single day in the class? That's us. So it's more than just media projects. From the center of the document that I just showed you are the following things. We're probably familiar with Madeline Hunter and the lesson cycle, right? Starting out with a demonstration, concepts, we're going to do some guided practice, and then we're going to do independent practice. It's a cycle. My wife and I this past summer were talking about lesson cycles and came up with this. Design, create, and share. Three steps, okay? Design the lesson. What are we going to learn about today? Let's learn about the International Space Station. Let's learn about how they just did this awesome, cool um, hatch that, that is now on the station. The first one blew up when SpaceX was launching like the Falcon 9. But it's now set up so they don't have to use the arm and have an astronaut there. Actually, commercial companies like SpaceX and Boeing, those are the two main ones that are taking stuff to the space station and are going to take us to Mars, that we think, within a few years. They can now dock with the space station. So we're going to do some kind of lesson. That's the design. We're going to watch a video. We're going to read a passage. We're going to act out a skit. What are we going to do? Step two is create. Okay. Now that we've been exposed to this content, now that we've you know, had some kind of a lesson, let's make something. How are you going to represent to me what you heard? I know you watched the video, but just watching the video doesn't mean that it connected to anything, it's gonna stick. So that's one of the reasons we want kids to create media is it will be stickier if they meaningfully create something and make something. It's also gonna give us a better window into their mind as far as what they learned and what they took away. Bless you. The third part is share. 
And that's what this green box with the white little symbols mean is sharing. And I'll say this in the closing keynote, but an inside sharing space is essential. And I think an outside sharing space is too. And these products that we're going to talk about can be shared in different places. And I want to encourage you, if you don't already have it, to have an inside space where your kids readily share with you and with each other. And then experiment with, how could we share this outside our class? How could my principal share this with parents? How could the school board, would the school board need to know how we're using iPads to you know, impact instruction and learning? Absolutely. And so these are things for us to think about. So levels, we got four of them, okay? Level one, I would call whole class response. These involve using a web browser or an app, but basically we can just all do these. And if we had more time, and maybe when I do this session again, I will actually do one. It's, it's great to do this as an activity, right? Because you would learn it at a different level. I would learn it different if we actually did it rather than just looked at it. But we're going to look at four of those, okay? Sticky note brainstorm, back channel document build, a back channel discussion, and a radio show. Whole class. My wife just did a, a whole session on radio show. Um, those are great things to do together. Level two. And this is a big thing that I've learned the last two years doing iPad media camps. How easy is it for us to overwhelm people with technology? Easy or hard? Easy. It is so easy. We are already overwhelmed, okay? I already have too much email. <laughs> I've already heard too many new things today. I mean, for them all to stick to my, to my brain. So one of my mistakes, I think, in iPad media camps the last three years was introducing app smashing to teachers too quickly. Oh, so you have that video that you did in, you know, in uh, Shadow Puppet, great, now let's save it to your camera roll, now let's take it to YouTube Capture, now let's put it on YouTube, you know, and people are like, blown away, they did that, but I don't, I, don't, I think that was going too, too advanced too quickly. It's like saying, here, let's just go to the high dive. First time in the swimming pool, okay, come over the high dive. Oh, it's okay, I'll hold your hand. You know, could I get you to go out the high dive? Maybe, but could I get you to do it again later on your own? Maybe not. So here's level two, single app projects. You just need one app. And they are not paying me to say this. They did give me a t-shirt in June when I was in Denver at ISTE. But Seesaw is like the app to rule them all on the iPad because it makes it so easy to create and have a picture, to add your voice, to make a drawing, to add a note, and then share it. See, this is one of the things Steve Jobs didn't think through much because, you know, it's okay. He was a great guy. And, you know, I love the iPad, but it wasn't designed for schools and it wasn't designed for sharing in a classroom. How do my kids turn stuff into me? Like this is basic, right? When I was teaching fourth grade in Lubbock, Texas at Wheelock Elementary School, uh, one of the things I learned in my teacher preparation program at Texas Tech, if I can say that without being struck down here, um, was just this idea of magic numbers, okay? So I had on my, um, by my desk, a couple bookshelves, and I, put, I taped numbers down, and all of my kids you know, had a number, and when they turned in their math, they would put it on their magic number. Well, why was it magic? Well, it wasn't, but I could just pick those up, and they were in alphabetical order, you know, and I would put something on the spot for the kids that were absent. Anyway, it was a big deal, right? I was just departmentalized with three classes, but three classes of 20 to 25 kids each picking up math assignments and grading them, that becomes a huge deal. How do you streamline the workflow of that? So that's why this, that's an analog example. This is a digital example. Digitally, how do your kids turn stuff into you? And is that an easy process? Okay, level three. Level three is gonna be the two app projects. I'm not gonna read them all, but these involve two steps. It's not just in Seesaw, okay? You're gonna make a word cloud. You're gonna make a photo collage. You're gonna make a multimedia ebook, and then you're gonna share another place, okay? So. It's what I would call a two-app project. And then level four is a multi-app pro uh, multi project. Some people call this an app smash, okay? A movie trailer, a narrated sketch note. I did a, a session yesterday mainly for our pre-service teachers here about narrated sketch noting, making a drawing and then adding your voice to narrate and having it play back. So just like you've seen maybe Dan Pink talking about motivation or Sir Ken Robinson talking about education. They have this amazing artist, you know, drawing pictures. And then as this drawing takes place, their voice is coming in. Some people call that a whiteboard animation. More complicated, right? I'm not going to start with that, but, but it can be compelling, can be effective. So let's jump in. 
In terms of technology learning sessions, I think there's three broad categories. There's the hands-on sessions, okay, which are the best. That'd be like iPad Media Camp. That'd be like a pre-conference workshop where let's, let's all make this together. Follow along can also be kind of good where you're, you're still a little bit hands-on, but you're not just focused on making it. Today, we're sort of at the worst in, in some respects. It's the demo, all right? Whoa, look at that. Look at Wes. He's just showing me all this stuff. But on the other hand, I'm not saying this is worthless because if I don't know it's possible, then I don't go seek the workshop or the chance to learn it or just even download the app. So while I am not a fan of 50 apps in 50 minutes, you know, and sometimes at these sessions or workshops, you'll see those. There is value to learning about the app. Sometimes your best takeaway, my best takeaway, isn't what was in the session. It was something that somebody else mentioned or you saw somebody else do and you're like, what? What is that? You know, what kind of stylus are you using? What app are you using? So anyway, we're on demos. So let's jump in. Level one projects. Um, first off, let me give you a chance. and I'm going to breathe myself. Uh, take about 60 seconds. Uh, talk with your neighbor about a whole class activity or what you've, if, even if you haven't done it, you've seen it. What's something you have seen or done with iPads that involve the whole class at the same time? What kinds of whole class iPad activities do we know about now? Talk. You have 60 seconds. Go. Okay, let, let's have a, a few people share. Tell me a few of those projects that are, would be like level one whole class activities. Well, the class that we just came from was um, with virtual field trips. Okay. And so it's like Google Cardboard for each virtual field trips? Some of or them were, and some of them were just apps that had everything in it. Okay. Um, but I feel like even if you were at, centered around one iPad for a classroom, if it could be projected, everybody can attend the field trip together, but then Something like this could be what did each different student take away from that that's right. maybe different. Yeah. Or maybe they were looking for a specific thing as a group. Or There's a, probably a more broad categorization of lesson activities, and some of them are going to involve watching and consuming, and another is going to involve creating and engaging, you know, where they're actually participating more than just I'm watching that. Right. But, so, but, but definitely, virtual field trips. Um, Carl Hooker, who's the founder of the feast of iPad Palooza, as it were, was just telling me this summer in June that Edmodo, which some schools are using, has some really good virtual field trips in them. Google just released Expeditions, which is for Google Cardboard, and you can get the actual cardboard, or we got plastic ones. You have to have pretty new smartphones or iPod Touches to use it. But, you know, even Google Place View, we have a, a couple families in our Sunday school class at church whose daughters just went to India. And I was actually showing them, I taught two weeks ago, Google Maps. And I was saying, hey, let's drop in because they said the address of where they were. Oh, look, there's a restaurant. And we were in a 360 degree panorama moving around, you know, looking at a restaurant. They're like, oh, man, that looks nice. It's clean. It's anyway, it was kind of cool to do. So virtual field trips, being able to experience places, go places we couldn't go before. Yes, we can do that. How, Tammy, who's on the front row, has had her kids. How have your kids taken field trips to the next level? Um, we do student-created field trips where students are creating and being the teacher and uh, sharing about something that's interesting in your backyard and then teaching it via distance to other students in the world. Okay. Yeah. So with, with a lot of these, there's going to be multiple levels that we can take them. What would be one more uh, whole class activity you've seen um, kids, students do with iPads? Okay. And then uh, in the lesson, you would place the pictures around the room. Okay. And then place it over, and then the audio would give a description of what happened. Okay. Because you would have the moral building before, the moral building after, Timothy McVeigh. Okay. And so you all built those pieces? Yes. Almost okay. like an interactive museum. Cool. Cool. Okay. All right. So 
I'm not exactly sure where that would fit in. Um, you, you can tell me. I, how many apps did that take? Did it take a couple apps to do that? You did Erasmus? Uh, it took one. Uh-huh. And then for a classroom that doesn't have 24 iPads, the professor was able to link it to Apple TV. Uh-huh. And then you could project it. Right. This is good. It's helpful for me thinking about this. Not that this is going to be comprehensive of everything. It's not. But it's interesting to think about where that fits. I have not. Is that like? Is that a little bit like um, Nearpod, where yes, you, where you're projecting to everybody? Yes. You yeah. Push your content and right. It's almost an auto response system for right. some assessment. So paired, yeah, Pear Deck. Uh huh. And then the other one was, I just said Nearpod. Nearpod. Yeah. I really like. Right. Um, and I'll tell you, this is more traditional, right? More traditional school is you're sitting in your chair. I'm up here talking. We're all doing the same thing. And there's, a, there's, there's good times and places for that. My predisposition is really to get us to shift to more student-created, individual kinds of projects. But that would, it would yeah, go here. So I probably they should put... They can draw responses. Um, they can touch places on a map that is you know, cool. interactive. But I'm leading the you're, lesson, you're so doing you're doing it. it. And then we're like, okay, let's go to the next slide. So yeah, that's, I'm glad you said that. I need to add that here. I need to add Pear Deck in your pod. Okay, so here's four. Sticky note brainstorm. How many of you used Padlet before? How many of us use sticky notes? Just the real sticky notes. Okay. So think sticky notes, all right? Padlet is a free website that uh, is like sticky notes, and this is how you could use it. Okay? So this is like a recipe for what your kids do. Here's an example. This is one we did this summer at iPad Media Camp. We built a structure, and it was a kind of a mystery build where only one person could go see it, and you, some people could only use their right hand and their left hand, and some people couldn't talk, and it was a design challenge, and then we reflected on it, and so that we shared pictures, and then people talked about how they could apply and use uh, Padlet. That, that's an example. Um, next one, back channel document build. How many of you have had students at the same time in a document typing together and being able to see each other type? Yes. Okay, what have you used to do that before? Well, I teach broadcast journalism, so my kids use Google Docs constantly for planning. Yes. Team planning. That yes. That is our go-to tool for collaboration. Right, and it is so powerful writing, to be able to... Has anybody written a thesis, dissertation, or other paper that had multiple revisions and you had to send it to different committee members and people? Have you, have you been in that situation? It, it, it cannot be fun, okay? Because, shoot, I just revised this, but you just graded or looked at the old version, and, and you're not looking at my new one. Oh, my gosh, that's painful. So there are tools like Google Docs that let us see each other's writing at the same time. In fact, I hope to bring him to Oklahoma City either this fall or spring. There's a wonderful educator and teacher named Ben Wilkoff. He's in Denver, and I think he's working in Aurora now. And at the uh, Colorado Google Summit, summer before last, I was in a session he did, and he just had a Google Doc up, and everyone linked to it. And we brainstormed together. And simply having that document up with a short link that we could easily type, I was like, that's so genius. Because so many of us have not experienced that. At a faculty meeting, you got to sign up for the next um, potluck, okay, that you're doing. But whether maybe it's at school, maybe it's at church or whatever. You're having a neighborhood one for, you know, whatever the meet the neighbors night or something like that. We're bringing the hot dogs, but who's bringing other stuff? You know, bless you. It is possible to have a Google Doc, set it up for anyone to edit. So I don't have to have your email address. You just have to be able to link to it. And then we could see each other's writing. That's powerful. We, we write grants that way at my school. We do our student handbook is written that way by multiple administrators. And so in QR code pasted on the wall, they link to so, so in Tammy School at How Public Schools in How Oklahoma, that kind of interactive writing has become normal. In different classrooms that have been go- using Google Apps for a while, where all the kids have Chromebooks, that happens. All right, and we've been using Google Classroom at our school now for a, a couple years. Here's another tool. You could use Google Docs for this. Um, this is another tool that's called TitanPad. It actually runs something called EtherPad. And by the way, when you click on these, if you, if you go to the matrix, you can click here where it says example, and that's what I'm showing you next. I'm showing you the example. This is an example of a lesson I taught in February on Leap Day. We have a, a special thing at our school when there's Leap Year, and uh, this one was on the elections. And so I did a session for all the 5th through 8th graders who wanted to sign up on social media and the elections. 
And this was before the primary. So how are the candidates using social media? We had them visit the, the Twitter pages and what were they tweeting or what was the team tweeting? YouTube, how often were they updating their YouTube channels and what kinds of videos? And then what was their position on things? What did it seem to be their number one issue or their top issues? And the way that I did this was I created for free a Titan pad that was a template. So it already had in to put in uh, a link to research links and then the biographical information. Who is your candidate? Where's your candidate born? How old is your candidate today? And then the Twitter content analysis. And so the neat thing about Etherpad, which is being, it's a free open source program, but somebody has to run it. And so TitanPad runs it for free for anybody that wants to. Um, the kids could go in, they have their own color, when they type and add stuff. And what's so cool, and I, don't have, I won't take the time to do it, but it has something called a time slider, and I can push play, and it actually shows how the whole document is built over time with color. I can see who did not contribute. You know, right. And also the thing I like is this is a chat area so that if they want to say something that's not on topic, it could be done over here. But again, it's going to need to be appropriate. And there's a lot of digital citizenship conversations we have. That would be called a back channel uh, document build. And you could do that with Google Docs or with Etherpad. Now, let's talk about a back channel discussion. How many of us have participated in a back channel, either on a webinar that you've been seeing where you have Q&A going, or you've just been at a conference where they say, hey, if you'd like to be in our back channel, go to today's meet. I'm seeing a few folks nod their heads, all right? We used to put those at today's meet up for discussion behind instruction. Okay. Great. Yes. And the kids just knew because one of the then it's not a whole bunch of people doing this yes. and then they forget what their question was there's not time, time to answer them all and then also it's just there's some stuff kids aren't going to say out loud or they're just not going to be raising their hand and there's lots of discussion about I've never done this with students without needing to say okay everybody I want you to put your lids down or apples up you know if it's iPad and we talk about digital citizenship we try to preface it by talking about we're accountable you're going to use your real first name I know you might use cool chick 87 or whatever, you know, on Instagram, but this is school and we're accountable for what we write and say. And I need you to help me kind of police our room because if we're doing, if, if, if inappropriate stuff is being done, guess what our principal is going to say to me about using these iPads? You know, we've got to take responsibility for this. So there's a lot of discussion and, and you never want to just throw kids into an open chat without preparing them for it, right? like a field trip. Are we ever just going to go to the zoo without talking about procedures? <laughs> no, because it's going to be chaos. Somebody's going to get lost and, you know, bad things can happen. So kids uh, will usually, you'll usually have someone blow it quickly after this. Because even, when does, when does executive function fully form in the male brain? 65, 70, right? No, it's supposed to be like mid-20s. Okay. But seriously, like we're dealing with kids and adolescents, you know, and even though we say, I know what computer you're on, you know, <laughs> Joey will still be like, you know, typing something goofy. Yeah. Be like, Joey, let's put your leg down. <laughs> sure. And talk about emojis and there's all kinds. But back channel discussion. Okay. Here's an example. This was one we did. Um, I think we might have done this, Tammy, when we were in uh, UCO at the, when we were doing the thing with uh, talking about blogging. I think so. Yeah. yeah. So, that, but, so it's archived. So it saves these, and we shared the link to it, and then different people could put in questions about stuff, could put in answers, you know, could share observations, and it's inside. If you don't have the link to this, you're not seeing it. So that's sort of the privacy piece or the confidentiality piece is if I'm not sharing the link, then you're not going to it. Okay, how are we doing on time? We're about halfway done. Radio show. This is the last of the whole group projects. How many of you um, have listened to a podcast before? I'm not talking about live radio, but you've, look at that, that's so awesome. Wow, that is the most hands I've ever seen in a room. And podcasting is maturing, right? There are more apps for listening to podcasts, and there are, there are more people producing podcasts. I love podcasts. I, I love the spoken word. I love oral history. I love how when I hear somebody talking, it's just different from reading their words on a page. You know, I've done a few interviews with my parents. We're both blessed, my wife and I, that, that our parents are still with us. We still have both grandparents, both sets. 
But like, this might be your takeaway from today. Who do you need to go interview like this weekend or Labor Day? Because you're going to get together with your family. Do you have an oral history interview with a parent, with a grandparent, with a child? You know, it could just be simple stuff. So what, what, are, what are you reading now? What are, you know, what's one of the best things that happened? We've done this with church, too. There's awesome stuff about what was it like growing up? What do you remember with your faith journey? You know, how have you seen God? You, I mean, simple questions, it can be really powerful. So here's an app for you, all right? Opinion. Opinion is free for iOS, for, uh, for iPhone, and for, and for iPad. And my wife has just done a session on this. Last year was her first year to do a classroom radio show. They did 35 different shows. And really, she didn't do it because her principal said, you need to be using technology. She does it because she wants to build community. She wants to build connections and develop literacy communication skills. How do we get better at oral presentations? By practicing. How do we get better at fluency? We practice. We practice. And so, anyway, radio show is very powerful. And here is a quick example. This is, hopefully going to be Kamzin um, presenting, or this is, well, yeah, this was episode 21 last year, Things We Are Grateful For, and it's just a picture of Kamzin, three minutes. This is my wife's classroom podcast. How cool. This is an example of outside sharing, okay? This wasn't just put in, and some of this is emotional because you know these kids and the things that are going on, and there's a lot of backstory to, to this. But how cool to have their voices, right? Um, and this is not something that's just hidden inside the class, okay? You don't have to log into Seesaw or be the parent of a child in order to see this. You can go to Shelly's uh, website. You can Google Shelly Fryer Classroom and click, and, and, and it's right there. So that is an example of a radio show. Okay, so 
we might not going to be getting through all these. We got about uh, 25 minutes, but that, that it's okay. We're doing all right. Um, and it, and uh, I don't know. We'll just kind of see. I I really think it's good to listen to those projects. In fact, if we had any more, more time, or I was doing less, we would we would talk about them. Okay, what was good about that? You know, how could what would you do with that? Would do you have character words, words of the week that you do, or? What do you? What kinds of concepts do your kids struggle with and really need, you know, to dig deeper with? Kids listen to each other differently than they listen to us. Have you noticed this? Yeah. I've noticed principals do too. Okay, <laughs> superintendents do too. Kind of peers listen to peers differently than when we're not like feeling we're on the same level or whatever. So, level two projects, single app projects, seesaw, and I actually only have one of these. But keep in mind, in seesaw, in this one app, you can share a link. You can write a note, you can upload a file, you can draw, you can uh, record a video, or what I like to do is say record it first and then upload it from your photo roll. Or you can go to your photo roll and put a video or put a picture. So here's one example. This is again gonna come from my wife's classroom. Um, this was something that uh, Camden, who had, had uh, been the artist of the previous one did. They listened to a podcast and they then drew a a picture about it and they reflected about it and this happened to be about the international space station and this is i think about a minute long my name is Carter, 20 seconds and i do this because i was listening to brains on the international space station it took me a while to draw and if i was in space my most favorite thing would be was no gravity now, one of the things I love about that is, do you see his sense of audience? Okay, because he was sharing this to his learning journal with his class, and he knew they could be responding. So, wow, that's kind of a, a cool thing there. But that's an example of a single app project that we, would, we, we could do in Seesaw. All right, so let's jump to level three projects. These will get a little bit more complicated, but they're not a full app smash with like three or four apps. And they're going to be eight, eight of them. Word clouds, photo collages, a five photo story, a narrated slideshow, a paper slide video, a radio show that kids would do by themselves, a quick edit video, and a multimedia ebook. Uh, word cloud. Um, how many of you use word clouds or you've used a word cloud before with kids? What are some things you've made word clouds about or how do you use word clouds? Okay. And I had gotten the idea because the year before PTO did that for us. They asked our kids things. Mm. And it was so powerful. I just thought I would love to give that experience to my kids. Yeah. And just to see the look on their faces when they read those words. I, I remember at, a, at summer camp, it was called Camp Out of Walden in Salina, Kansas. Uh, it was a church camp. I remember we did it at the end of the week, and it was just like um, I don't know, things we respect or things we, we um, enjoy about someone else. And I kept that in my Bible forever. I, it might even still, I don't know. I don't know if I saw that one, but I, could, I, I kept it for a long time. It meant a whole lot. So word clouds can be things like that. You can also take documents. We could take the State of the Union address, right? We could say, what are the patterns? How many times was terrorism mentioned? How many times was, you know, a different word mentioned? And we can analyze things. So I the student writing so that they can see that they use the word happy 52 times. Ah, because how great. That's will. great size the words based on how frequently Correct. So mm -hmm. And so we, we used to do that and find the words that were good too many times. Yep, yep. Writing. It's another tool for kind of peering in and seeing patterns mm -hmm. with, a, with a, a paragraph or, or a, a paper. So Word Clouds by ABCA is a free app for, for iPad that does Word Cloud. There's also a bunch of other apps and, and most of those that I've found are paid apps. If you have another one, uh, let me know what it is uh, because I'd like to, to be able to have that linked and, and to try it out. Um, you could just make the word cloud. You can copy and paste the text, but then you could also have an extension. And on a lot of these recipes, I have an extension. So an extension would be a narrated photo to narrate it. So that's what Abraham did here. And let's give a listen to this. Traits, my character traits. I am I created artistic working people for 
Hard. Hard working. Hard working. And playful, confident. The, the recording of the podcast comes out in these other, you know, recordings as far as the modeling of that and talking about to their audience. Is there power in this or what? Right? Not just having the words on the page, but speaking the words and hearing the words. Oh, it's a lot, lots of power here. Wes, is there a best way to set up a recording spot? Does your wife have a spot or is it... She's kind of all over. Kind of all over she, and are they recording directly to their iPad? Or th- in that case, they were recording directly to Seesaw and... They, you know, they only have a few desks. She, she d- ditched the desks a couple years ago and has just different learning spaces, carpet squares and, mm-hmm. and um, you know, a, a kitchen table and, and bar stools and different things. So they're, they're in different spots. And if, if, sometimes it is nice to be able to go to a quiet spot, but, but it can work, you know, even if you don't. And they don't have microphones or anything um, separate to well, use. In high school, we did the same thing with this, except we used Word, Photo. Okay. And they took a selfie after they had Ooh. done a personality quiz to see which of these words the okay. best fit them. And Word, Photo and made? Word, Photo, scanned a QR code, Okay. went to Word, Photo, and had the instructions. And boy, did they love it. Awesome, awesome. That's great. It's in the hallway. It's in the hallway. Right. All the elementary kids that mm-hmm. come by. They just and this is why we need to share projects, right? Because those kind of things, like, you could do that tomorrow. And, and it might not even have the technology. You know, some of these things you can do without the technology. But with the technology, I mean, how cool that we could hear Abraham in his own voice, you know, reading his. And then his mom... You know, if she's connected with her smartphone, got a text message when that got shared to Seesaw to say, hey, Abraham just made this. And then she can talk to him about that. It's good stuff. And they have a student actually say it about themselves. Oh, yes. So that's what I, it's these are mine. Oh, that's yes. Absolutely, absolutely. Photo collage. I would be willing to bet some money, but I'm not going to, that you have someone in your life who makes photo collages for Instagram or Facebook. This has become a very common thing, right? Being able to take photos, add filters, make a collage. The best app I've found for the classroom is called Pick Collage for Kids. Pick Collage for Kids lets you make a collage, but it also doesn't rely only on pictures you've taken on your device. There are searching options, and it's relatively web safe. I mean, there's no guarantees, but they've got Library of Congress and some other things that you can search for. So kids can find pictures. They can also put stickers and icons and things like that. So here's a couple examples. Um, my wife actually made these. They did a STEM project uh, a year ago called Jitterbug Robots. In fact, I'm doing a STEAM club with our elementary art teacher this year. And this will be one of the, f- this will probably will be the first project we'll do where you take a, um, like a, what is it, eight volt motor, five volt motor, I should know the voltage, I haven't done it in a year. <clears throat> but basically you, you get batteries and you put a glue stick, I'll show you a video of, of it in a second, and the kids make these um, robots, or these little jitterbugs that, that jump around, because kind of like when your uh, dryer is off balance and it starts to make noise, you put a glue stick on this motor and then it spins around, and anyway, so that's a, that's a photo collage of that. It's actually easier for me to show you a video of it than to try to explain it, but that was a collage of pictures, that was a Lego tower uh, build that they did, photo collage. Five photo story. Um, this is one of the, the projects on Show With Media, and the idea is have kids summarize something in five pictures. You don't get to use text. You don't get to record audio. And here's an example. This is Red Riding Hood. Now, this may be the scariest human Red Riding Hood you've ever seen. That was at an iPad media camp, I think, three years ago. Uh, I did up in Manhattan, Kansas at K-State, where my parents live. And this is Rachel, our youngest daughter. Look at the use of the augmented reality with the iPad wolf mouth and then the axe. I loved it. But, you know, take the chapter that we're reading now or take, take the novel that we just read. And with your group, I want you to to take five pictures. When I was working with teachers in Yukon as an instructional coach, um, one of the eighth grade English teachers needed to set up some limits on props. And so she said, things you can put in a backpack, all right? If you can get in a backpack, you can bring it to class and use those for props. 
but they checked out the iPad cart from the library and the kids were taking their pictures and then they you know, submitted them to the teacher. Five photo story. Narrated slideshow. I think this is one of the best projects to introduce to students at all levels because it's easier to get a high, I've got to be careful with easy. When you reduce the complexity of the project and you focus in on still pictures and recorded voice, I have seen more high quality narrated slideshows created by students than full length videos, okay? Because we're going to talk about green screen and other things, but man, it's, it's pretty hard to create high quality full, full, full motion video. But if it's just still pictures and voice, we can really be intentional about what picture is going to speak to that paragraph you just wrote. And can you use your expression? Can you, you know, pr pronounce those vocabulary words correct? You can get multiple tries, right? You don't know how many times they've done. So I'm not going to play this whole thing. This is called IFE at Yurkel. I'll only play a little bit of this. But it's a pretty good example. This was our middle child when she was in sixth grade. The teacher at class in SAS had assigned groups and given each of them a different volcano. And there were different vocabulary words that they had to use. And they had to, anyway, follow the rubric to create the project. So this was their project. Pause it there. Did she pronounce pyroclastic right? I think, so. I think so. Do you have any idea how many times she practiced? And the only reason I can say IFE at Yurko is because those kids were recording it in our kitchen on a Saturday and they, you know, they did it multiple times. Narrated slideshow. There's lots of things that are good about this, right? Large images. I like the attribution right on the slide. It tells me, oh, that's from Boston.com, Boston Globe, maybe. Um, I like how the images add so much. There's not too much text on the screen, okay? No one tells our eye when we start to process an image where to start and where to stop. When we're doing text, if we're reading English or another language that reads to, you know, left to right, top to bottom, we process it in a certain way. Images are different, they're powerful. So a lot more neurons that connect our eyes to our brain than our ears to our brain. So anyway, that is the narrated slideshow. Paper slide video, who's made one of these? Okay, Here, I love projects that are like old school meets new school. Okay, these are the steps for what you, how you can make it. Let's watch a 74 second one, all right? We were just, Cam and I were just talking about this. This is like my favorite short example. How to make a paper slide by Andrea. Steve. Karen. Gordon. Ashley. Barbara. Karen. Have an idea. Write a script. Make your slides colorful. Use colorful images and large print. Practice, practice, practice before you record. Record your video in one take. And remember, mistakes are okay. Publish or share your video in the classroom, using the computer, and online. The do's. Have fun. Landscape format. Use color markers. Tripod so it doesn't shake. Two people, one to read the script and one to slide the paper. Close to the recorder so you can hear. One take. How would you use it in your profession? Yay, paper slide video. Is that something you could do? 
Yeah, because we got what we need. Paper, colored pencils, pens. Does anyone in your room have a device that records video? <laughs> How many do you need? One, you could take turns, right? So I love that project. And that is, that's an example of what I would call a quick victory. That's something we, could, we can do tomorrow. Radio show, um, we already did a whole class radio show. If you want your students to do an individual one, that's the app I'm recording this session with right now. It's called Voice Record Pro. It's free. And so your students can make a recording. It could be a minute long. It could be 10 minutes long. You probably want to put some constraints on that because you can't scan through audio the way you can text. But then students can save it from their iPad as a video and then share it um, to wherever, wherever they're turning it in. Um, very quickly, this is one that my students did, I think, three years ago. We were doing a unit on the science and technology of music and sound. I borrowed tuning forks from the FOSS kit that the fifth grade science teacher had, and my kids um, were, ex were, were trying to explore how sound moves, okay? And this is about a minute long. And if they were writing an essay, we wouldn't have gotten. Hey, hello, guys. Welcome, hey, hello, guys. Welcome back to the, the episode. This time that you can hear Madison. This is, this is uh, Dr. Fryer's classroom. This is Andrew, Madison, and Evan talking on this video. And today's this is my birthday. We're basically record, recording this on the same thing that was in the Zion episodes. So, um, yeah, it's still my birthday. Actually, this is what happened. Um, today is his birthday, and we're going to celebrate his birthday today. But, but, uh, <laughs> and also, and also, and also, welcome back! Yay! Yeah. Well, we have a scientific story for you. Okay, we are talking okay. about this little microphone thing. Okay, okay, hit it, Andrew. Well, the cup phones are special type of phones that that sh that have certain amount of things. A, a string and it's like it makes things louder. Yeah. And so whenever you speak, everything sounds louder. No, it sounds quieter. And and <laughs> and if you do that, the black friends can come through. If it comes through the water, yeah, and both the black friends can come through. The vibration comes through the water or our string. Yeah. Tell them, Evan. <laughs> so <laughs> not doing it in your like that. Isn't that cool? You can really hear it. Did Madison get it? <laughs> the vibration comes through. Uh, I love that. For so many reasons, I love that. I guarantee these three special friends would not have given me that much at that station if I said write that down yeah. right. or if I said type that. Right. In fact, they self-selected audio. They were actually supposed to do something else at that particular station. But hey, <laughs> they chose the tool that they wanted and they communicated their understanding. And even in their group, there's some argument about how that is working, right? But this gives transparency and visibility into the thinking of my kids that I would not have had with a class of like 32 kids, all right? Oh my gosh, and we're gonna and we're gonna celebrate today. And then Andrew said, "But we're not talking about that." I mean, that one like video. I there's so many things that are good about that. Don't you always want an Andrew in your class saying, "We're not talking about that." And also, the good stuff comes later. When I've noticed this, when kids are recording this stuff, they kind of have to do an introduction, and some stuff comes out. Generally, if there's good stuff, which there's not always, it'll be later. Tammy. I Absolutely, absolutely. Yep, yep. They just put it in the camera. I mean, that's why Seesaw is the app. It's so powerful. All right, quick edit video. And I think we got about uh, uh, four minutes. Um, a quick edit video is, is one you do quickly. All right, it does not take a lot of editing. It doesn't take hours and hours. You know, you might just shoot it as is and done. You know, we're turning it in. Um, here's an example. This one did have a little bit of editing. This is the, the video or a video from my wife's classroom doing the jitterbug. So now you get to actually see, maybe, come on, play, the jitterbug robots. Kids did very different approaches to this. This was sort of more like a windmill. After we did this, no, it was, this is just a, just a small motor with a glue stick and then the hot glue guns to, to put them together, large paper clips, um, old CDs. And after we made this, we realized there was one child who we weren't supposed to share his picture. So we learned, figured out on the iPad how to, how to pixelate that. Um, I wrote a post about that because it was such a great video. 
It was a quick edit video. All right. We're going to need to go through these, and I'm, I'm not going to have time to play the examples. The examples are here. You can check them out. Uh, but multimedia ebook, an ebook that has text, it has images, it has audio, kids' voices reading, you know, the paragraph. Uh, one of my favorite examples was from uh, Sarah's third grade class. Uh, I, I just love listening to those kids' voices. That's the end of level three projects. We're not going to probably have time. Well, I'll play one. It's so silly. Um, level four projects. Talking avatar. Do you all know about Yakit Kids or Chatter Picks? Oh, my gosh. So here we go. Uh, so yeah, this is just this is one from some teachers at, iPad, at an iPad uh, camp. It's okay. Redirect is fine. At an iPad media camp in uh, Stillwell, Oklahoma. This is just a very... Very simple one. My name's Mr. Caterpillar, and I'm very hungry. <laughs> Take a picture, put the mouth where you want it, sometimes put the googly eyes, and record. And the mouth moves when your mouth moves, okay? Fun. Those are fun apps. And so that's, I would call that a talking avatar video. Um, green screen videos. Oh, my gosh. You know, people have done whole sessions on green screen videos. My wife's, this is my favorite of all time, they did I Have a Dream speeches, uh, what the kids' dreams are for their lives and for our society. And I cannot watch that without being emotional, so I will not be playing that right now. But it's very powerful. Um, an iMovie trailer. Anybody made one of these? Oh, my gosh, so fun. Um, I will play this. Um, we'll, let's see if it'll... And one thing, while you're loading that up, the iMovie trailer has a template that you can print out and let them use those as Absolutely. I've got it linked on here. Elementary class, this is called Levers. This is Autumn Laidler's um, fifth grade science class in Chicago. This is an iMovie trailer. study more about levers yes exciting okay Tammy mentioned that there was some great um, uh, PDFs um, I have a link to Tony Vincent's that he did um, it shows you exactly what the shots are and what you need basically you want to have a bunch of media either recorded video or still images and then those get pulled into the little boxes where they go you don't get to change the music you can change the whole theme but inside a particular theme you go with the music you, you, you there's limited options to change but you can change text and what they see so that's iMovie trailer um, simulation or game I don't have time to play this but there's a video of one of my fourth grade girls uh, two years ago who did amazing stuff in Hopscotch. Hopscotch is my favorite coding app for intermediate and, and middle school students, intermediate elementary and, and middle school. I have a free book actually on, called Hopscotch Challenges that you can find on iBookstore or on Amazon. They've updated it a little bit, but it, it shows you how to make a collide game and how to do a simple sort of spirograph repeating tessellation project where a square or, or an octagon or something like that is moving. Kids are doing math. They're doing all kinds of math as they're coding and they're making a simulation. Stop motion movie. My kids love this. Lego stop motion. Coma Coma is my wife's current favorite app um, that has been free. Ann Beck was telling us about that. Um, we won't play that. Uh, a narrated sketch note. I did a session yesterday about that. Um, again, that's where you're sketch noting, but then you hear the voice of the person talking about it as it plays back. <sighs> we're on a journey, okay? I don't know if you're a Lord of the Rings fan, but I am. <laughs> Fortunately, we're not hopefully going to Mount Doom. Um, but we are on a journey of learning how to use these tools and learning how to use them with our kids. And it is a journey, and, and we all need to be patient with ourselves and patient with each other because we're in different places. We've done different things. What I hope is that this matrix will inspire you to think about something new and that you'll share it, all right? Please take this back. I've got more stickers if you want to take more stickers to give to other people and let me know. There's all kinds of things we can do with the iPad. One of the best things is to have our kids show us what they know. 
What can you do? What do you understand? And even when they get to the point of being able to choose the tool, like those kids in the, in the string phone center, awesome. Okay, because they've shown me what they know and they understand, and I'm able to have better conversations with them and with their parents about what we're learning, what we're doing, and you know where we're going to go next. So thank you all so much for coming, and have a great rest of the conference. Thank you. Thank you.